Well, good morning, everybody. And uh, before I start, first like to say hi to Julian Barnicol, PhD student, and also he has helped me with this uh, setting up this whole class. Very thankful to him for that. Thank you, Julian. So I am Balkrishna C. Rao, uh, Associate Professor, Department of Engineering Design at IIT Madras in India. We are currently ranked as the number one institute in India, IIT Madras, and there is also a very deep German connection with IITM. Uh, Germany supported us when we started, you know, IITM. Different countries supported different IITs, and Germany supported IIT Madras. So there's a lot of German connection. So when you come to our campus, you can see that. We also have some German faculty members who are part of our group now. Uh, I'm also the ICCR visiting chair. That's the position on which I... Uh, came to this place, uh, to LUH. Uh, this is awarded by the Ministry of External Affairs in India uh, in the area of frugal engineering. So without much further ado, let me get started. Uh, just a second. Yeah. So. First, I'd like to thank, of course, uh, Ministry of External Affairs, Government of India. Okay, so they made this position possible. And this was done through their arm called uh, the Indian Council for Cultural Relations. Okay, and uh, so this was sponsored through the ICCR. So it's a visiting chair position in the area of frugal engineering. So I've been working in this area for the last uh, decade, you can say, one of the early researchers in frugal engineering. So thanks to LUH and ICCR, this position was made possible. Also like to thank uh, IIT Madras and the Department of Engineering Design, where I work. Uh, thanks for a nice, you know, uh, conducive environment and good infrastructure, which made this research possible in frugal engineering. Very thankful to IIT Madras for that. And a word about engineering design, we are a new department in IIT Madras. We started, I think, about maybe a decade ago. And uh, we are a combination of automotive and biomedical. So we are the design and manufacturing for automotive and biomedical. Okay, so, and a lot of industry interactions between engineering design and um, uh, industries in India and also abroad. And of course, very thankful to Leibniz uh, Universität, okay, Hanover. Uh, they made this position possible. Very thankful to my uh, kind host, Professor Ingo Liefner, from Economic Geography. Uh, thanks to him, this position was made possible. He's also my uh, kind host and also collaborator. We work in the area of frugal engineering, so have a couple of research projects together. We also have a PhD student together, and uh, I'm looking forward to this collaboration. Also like this opportunity to thank uh, Dr. Bala Ramani from the international office. Uh, who also spent a lot of effort in getting me here, okay, and uh, also made this position possible. Also, thanks to Bala Ramani for his uh, timely help, suggestions, and all of that. So, thanks to the entire LUH team. And without much further ado, I'll get going now. And like I said, anytime if there is a problem in understanding me, kindly intervene, okay? Don't hesitate. So, the grading policy, right, for this uh, class. I, I believe everybody here is an engineer, right? Everybody is an engineer. So, I will be setting a take home exam after we are done with this class. And this will basically deal with the material covered in this class, okay, today, whatever we are going to do. Uh, and I'll be basically looking at your concepts. Of course, I'll be looking at answers too, but I also want to see how well you have understood the material and answer the questions, okay? Answer is one thing, and also how you have approached engineering from a perspective of frugality. We're going to look at a very, you know, a different way of looking at engineering, okay? It is the same traditional principles, but we are tweaking it, modifying it a little bit. Uh, more on concepts, and this is going to be a take home, so uh, you can, uh, I'm told that this will be recorded, and when it's available, you can also uh, look at the material covered here, and also read some of my papers to answer the questions. It should not be a problem, okay? So this will be a take home, and we'll set the date for when you have to turn in your assignments. We'll look at that. And we'll take your uh, uh, timing and other things into consideration, okay? Accordingly, set a timeline for that. Today's material 
is going to be covered in uh, three sessions. Okay, three different sessions. But first, I'll talk briefly about what I do in manufacturing. Manufacturing is my primary area, and now I've gotten into frugal engineering, and I, I want to combine the two. So I'll be talking briefly about what I do in manufacturing. And then, in three sessions, we'll be covering climate change and uh, sustainability, okay? And then we are going to get to something called frugal innovations, and then advanced frugal innovations, and then we are going to start with frugal engineering, okay, which comprises design, complex systems, frugal manufacturing, and also uh, quality control. And uh, we will have time for questions and answers. And I'll also, uh, you can ask me questions and answers, and we can talk about that. So manufacturing research, my group is involved in what is called LSEM, Large Strain Extrusion Machining. So uh, if you do a machining operation, you will, you, you will know that a lot of the chips are wasted, right? A lot of material is wasted in making a new product or a new machined uh, surface. So is there use for all those chips that are coming out? So that is what we have done here. We are combining extrusion with machining to actually you know, uh, get chips in the form of foils. So each of those foils you see there is actually a chip coming out from a product. Okay, so we are combining extrusion with machining to make a new bulk form out of a new material. So the parent material is, has a you know, uh, kind of uh, bigger grain structure, but the chip has an ultra fine grain structure, so it has better properties. Uh, is there a problem in looking at the slides? You want to go back maybe? Or you, know, like you have to strain your neck, right? Am I right in that? Okay. So it's okay, maybe probably you can go back. I didn't realize that part, okay? So whatever is convenient, do that, no issue. So if you think it's straining your neck, you can you know, uh, go to the back seats, not a problem. So this is one area, large strain extrusion machining. The other thing if you do, you know, if, if you've worked in the area of machining, we have a lot of problems with vibrations, what we call self-excited vibrations, right? So this is, uh, the energy for the vibration is given by the process itself, okay? Do you know of any other examples of a self-excited vibration? You know about free vibration, you know about force vibration, but there is something called self-excited, right? The process itself gives the energy. Anything comes to your mind? These are very catastrophic. You know, they, they can get really dangerous, right? An example is earthquakes, right? Earthquakes are self-excited. Once they start, you can't stop them. Energy is given by the process itself, and it gets catastrophic, right? You have tsunamis and whatnot. So, but in manufacturing, you have something called chatter. And uh, as you can see here, right, with time, a force signature which looks very steady can get, you know, unbounded. Okay, your peak-to-peak -peak increases. And, uh, you know, if you don't control this, it, it can get very bad. You have to stop the machine, basically. Otherwise, it's, it's bad for the operator, bad for the machine tool, and also bad for the product. Uh, but one thing that you can do as engineers, can, can I predict this? Okay, so that is what my group does. We can actually predict this phenomenon. Okay? So we combine mathematical modeling of self-excited vibration with cutting process mechanics, and we combine it together. And then we do a lot of frequency response measurements to you know, get the inputs to run this program. And once you do that, you can actually predict the start or onset of chatter. So if my peak-to-peak -peak rises right to this level from a steady state, I know this is chatter. And we have good you know, comparison with uh, measurements. And we use this with a lot of manufacturing companies to help them solve their chatter problems. So if I have the cutting conditions and the machine tool frequency response uh, data, I can actually give you a window where I won't see chatter, something that we call uh, you know, a stability lobe diagram. So we plot these diagrams. And somewhere here, you don't see chatter, but somewhere here, you see chatter. So I can take a cutting condition here, very high speed at a very high depth of cut. Okay? So my productivity is very high, but without you know, any machining chatter. So this is also what my group does. We're also involved in constitute laws. You know, when you have to, uh, uh, many of the deformation mechanisms and engineering phenomena are so complex uh, that you have to use numerical methods to predict. Uh, so if you have to use FEM, one thing very important for that is how does your material behave? What's the model for your material? And that is what we call a constitutive law, right? So we have developed a constitutive law for super alloys, like titanium and nickel alloys, uh, using machining data. 
Because if you take tension and compression data, tension test, mechanical test, your strains and strain rates are very low. But machining strains and strain rates are quite high. We are looking at strains from 2 to 20, and strain rates of 10 raised to 5 or 10 raised to 6 a second, OK? And temperatures are very high, about 400 degrees Celsius, high pressures. So this is a set of conditions which are very aggressive. So your standard constitutive models will not work. So we use machining data to generate constitutive laws. And one law that we have developed is called uh, the zarelli armstrong model. We have modified that using machining data. And that can be used to predict metal cutting. And here you see the shear localized chip, shear localization occurring in machining. Very difficult to predict. But with a good constitutive law, this is doable very well. Okay? And we use this to do finite element modeling of uh, uh, real-time cutting processes, like three-dimensional milling and others, but using our constitutive model. And we are getting pretty good predictions with that. We can predict cutting forces, power, residual stresses, you know, a lot of uh, other parameters which are relevant to process design and also machine tool design. My group is also involved in SPD, not the German political party, but uh, what we call uh, severe plastic deformation. Okay? So machining as a severe plastic deformation. Uh, because your plastic strains are very large, strain rates are high, so machining is actually an SPD process to produce new materials. Okay? So here you can see that we have taken a, a dog bone specimen from the chip material. It's a very small dog bone, as you can see, we call it a micro dog bone. The gauge length is about a centimeter, and your gauge section is about 0.8 by 0.8 millimeters. And we have tested this to figure out you know, how good my chip and the bulk is, and you can see that there's an increase in the strength, but a reduction in ductility. Okay, so we need such data to see how the chip can be put to better use, okay, in the form of a bulk form. So machining as an SPD technique. We also do a lot of uh, electron microscopy in the group, okay? So here is one of my PhD students who did very good work in my, you know, electron and uh, optical microscopy together with modeling to figure out how to suppress shear localization in metal cutting. So when you cut aerospace materials like titanium-6 Al4V or Inconel-718, have you heard about these alloys, Ti-64 and Inconel-718? So whenever you fly, whenever you take that flight, your gas turbine engines are running, you know, turbines made of this material. And they are called super alloys because they can retain their strength at very high temperatures. So when you're flying, you're actually, the temperatures for the combustion will be close to 800 to about 1,200 degrees Celsius. Many of your normal materials will not function. So you need super alloys for that. But the same properties that make super alloys very strong, they also create problems when you try to manufacture them. They're very strong. So if you have to manufacture something, it takes more forces and better machine tools and newer processes. And typically when you do machining, you see this shear localization. You know, uh, this is what I mean by shear localization. You, you get a segmented chip, each of the section, there is a little shear band called a localized shear band between two undeformed segments. It's a mode of deformation, very normal to these alloys, but that creates problem in the manufacturing of these alloys, okay? So you get a cyclic force signature, which leads to chatter, okay? And it also, you know, decreases the productivity. So is there a way to suppress it? So we have actually figured out that if you modify the texture of the uh, feed material through cold rolling and then machine it, you can actually suppress you know, uh, shear localization. So by doing this, we can avoid chatter. And number two, I can get an ultra fine grain material. The chip becomes a useful product. Okay, so we, we do this kind of work. We're also involved in additive manufacturing. A student of mine has built uh, uh, a nice 3D printer in-house for low melting point uh, metallic alloys, like tin, solder, right, all of those. But we're also looking at, we're we using this to study the microstructure evolution for high temperature materials, like super alloys. So we are actually looking at you know, uh, depositions from Inconel 718 to study the mechanical properties. A big problem when you additively manufacture metallic parts is anisotropy. You get a columnar grain structure, okay, and anisotropic properties. So how do we avoid that? Uh, it, it's, it's, it's doable, you have to use suitable process conditions by studying the process theoretically and use those conditions to get an equiaxed structure and to get isotropic properties, okay? So group is involved in that, in the modeling of additive manufacturing 
and uh, also looking at uh, empirical tests to validate our theory and also put it to good use. So here is also an example of what we do. Theoretically, we can predict the uh, details of the med zone, okay? Uh, am I going at a good pace? Understandable, right? Uh, no issue in accent and everything is okay, hopefully, right? Any, any uh, doubts, let me know. Okay, we'll be starting with the class from here onwards. And again, for some of you who might have neck getting strained, you can sit at the back, okay? Sorry, I didn't realize that because yeah, it's, it's quite up there. It's like watching the movie in the front row, right? I mean, you never want to have that seat. It's really a pain. Okay. Uh, we'll start session one with sustainability, okay? What is sustainability? I, I think we, we need this background to go where I'm taking you, okay? For, to frugal engineering. You need to know this background to know why, why we need frugal, okay? Why do we need to define something new? Uh, I think the first place to start, obviously, will be, you know, uh, what are the major points that are going around in the world which is of concern in all walks of life, not just engineering. What I'm showing you here, it's affecting everything, any, any endeavor of humans, okay? Our major challenges are global population and climate change currently, okay? And uh, energy consumption is 7 into 1960s. This was around 2010. I'm sure the multiplying factor has gone higher than that. Population is inching towards 8 billion mark, right? And end of 21st century, global average temperature would increase without action now. Okay, so I don't know how many of you realize there is something called climate change going on, and it's an irreversible phenomenon. We are already into it, right? We are already into it. We can't come out. So we have to figure out a way to adapt living with it, and at the same time try to mitigate it. Uh, the next couple of slides, I'm going to show you the effects of climate change, okay, what's happening and just to get your interest. The recent heat wave in Europe, right, we've all talked about that and uh, this is a map that shows how it feels like in different, the stress, how does it feel? It says the heat stress, a measure of how conditions uh, feel based on air temperature, you know, uh, solar radiation, humidity and wind speed. Very strong heat stress feels like 38 to 46 degrees Celsius. Extreme heat stress feels like 46. So all the very red regions are like extreme and the different shades that you see also show, you know, uh, you're looking at anywhere between 40 to about 46, okay? This is kind of unheard of, okay? I mean, yes, we, we, we do get heat waves. There is a natural seasonal variability. We do get winters, we get summers, we have autumn, but you know, uh, there is an increased frequency of these things happening now. Okay, it's unpredictable. And in fact, I think from the news that I, re news that I saw and also read, it looks like uh, what happened in London, in the UK at least, it was kind of unheard of. I never expected such high temperatures. So yeah, this is, and there is something called attribution science. I don't know how many of you have heard about it. It's a new field that came in the last decade Attribution science. And what it does is, it takes any uh, problem around this planet that has happened, like a flood, a drought, or a heat wave, and it says what is the effect from climate change, teasing it apart, which is very important, okay? So that you can quantify it. And now we can say with certainty that all these events are because of climate change. There is a contribution from climate change. That is why they are happening with sort of more frequency. Uh, Europe's heat wave. Anybody knows what, which place this is? I'm sure. Any guesses? It should not be a guess. Come on. I think I'm sure you all want to be there during summertime. There's also a, a French company that makes pens and watches based on this. Mont Blanc. Exactly. Okay. And this is interesting. It came on BBC. It said that. Uh, a 15,000 euro deposit to climb Mont Blanc, okay? And this is just, it, in, it includes the rescue if you get trapped somewhere, and the other part, I believe, is also to, uh, uh, 10,000, I think, for the rescue, and the other part is the deposit. 
okay? And this is happening because apparently with the heat wave, a uh, lot of the ice has kind of thawed. And so it is, it is, it is kind of quite uh, bad to climb the mountain now, okay? It's, it's kind of very uncertain scenario. You don't know what might happen. You might get trapped, avalanches, all kinds of things, higher likelihood. So with the current heat wave, they're actually charging you a deposit of 15,000 euros to climb, you know, Mont Blanc. By the way, we'll have a little break at 10.30, okay? I won't be taking you continuously through it. So we'll have a 10-minute break at 10.30, just to, uh, so that I don't want to sit, make you sit here for six hours, you know, just uh, uh, listening to me and getting tired. Any questions, please ask. Uh, losing Greenland, there is a very high likelihood that you know, the ice sheets that we see around in uh, Arctic and the Antarctica, we might lose them, okay? It's an extreme scenario, but already some melting is happening. And because this volume has to be conserved, right, the sea level rises, the sea level rises. Any idea what this is on the other side? Can anybody guess, you know, that bubbling that you see there? Right, this one. Class has to interact, okay? I want... Uh, also want to hear your views. Any idea what that might be? Any guesses? Don't, uh, yeah, please. Is there some kind of gas captured in the water? Uh, gas captured in the water. Any idea what gas it might be? Very good, very good. What kind of gas can that be? Climate change is due to what? Any idea? We have something called greenhouse gases, right? Right? As uh, you have any idea about what climate change is all about? Uh, mainly we talk about carbon emissions, right? Carbon dioxide emissions. So carbon dioxide emissions, this forms like a, uh, the emissions that we have now, it, it forms a layer around the planet. So the incoming solar radiation, which gets reflected back, doesn't go into the space. It again gets reflected by this wave, you know, by this film of, thick film of carbon and comes back to Earth. And that's how it heats up the planet. That's what we call global warming. Okay? But, but this is not carbon. Okay? It's another greenhouse gas. So, any idea what it might be? It's also in the news. Yeah. Methane. Yeah, exactly. Methane. So, methane is a much more powerful greenhouse gas. So, uh, when you emit methane, it creates more warming and uh, more potent, more powerful than carbon dioxide. And all of this is like a, a positive feedback. It just keeps heating the planet more and more. So the more you heat, the more these gases are released because the, the, the ice is kind of melting. So it is releasing all the methane that has been locked up in the ground. Okay, and this is happening throughout the planet. The oceans are getting warmer. They're also releasing the uh, gases that they have stored. So it, it's like a positive feedback. It's getting bad and bad. Okay, yeah, that's methane, you're right. By the way, uh, any idea when the last climate change occurred? Would you have uh, any idea about that, when the last climate change occurred? This was human-induced, right? I mean, what we are going through is human-induced, meaning humans have caused it, you know, mainly. Right from the days when we started agriculture to, you know, including all the industrial revolutions, everything included, this is where we are today. The last time climate change occurred, any idea? Any, any hints? Yeah. Uh, after the industrial, revolution. industrial revolution is the current one. We are going through it. So now we have to go like millions of years before. Yeah. Yeah, before the Ice Age. Yes, you're right. I mean, what we had, uh, volcanoes at that time. Right? Super volcanoes. So like you've seen the movie Ice Age, right? I mean, something like uh, very medieval Earth. And volcanoes what, are what caused the first climate change. Okay, the second one is now. Usually, a you know, uh, uh, a climate change is followed by a glacial age, like she mentioned, or an ice age. So we have to be careful about that. It, it is like a cycle, but this one is induced by humans. What we are going through now, okay? What we are going through currently. This is we are also having more intense storms, by the way. Okay, so because the oceans have warmed up, right? So there is uh, more evaporation. So this, all of this feeds into more intense hurricanes or cyclones. And they also move very slow once they are formed. So with the, with the result that you're dumping more rain, okay, you're dumping more rain, more bad weather, and for a longer period in time. Okay, and this is also getting frequent. 
This is also getting frequent. There is a tsunami in Greenland. I don't know how many of you knew this, but in 2017, one of the uh, bigger, I think, glaciers, or I believe uh, a flank of a mountain collapsed because it was supported by ice, which kind of thawed, warmed up, and so that led to a lubricating effect where this entire flank fell into the ocean, and it, 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 it created a wave about uh, 200 to 300 feet tall wave. It washed out a couple of villages. Okay, in Greenland. This was actually in the news in 2017. Not many paid uh, attention to it at that time. Uh, the sea is also kind of uh, uh, Arctic ice, right? Arctic snow is receding faster now. So usually your, your, your winter months extend to a certain time and there is a certain amount of snow and ice that you expect, but all that is reducing. With the result that you think there is more water, okay, and there is, it's, 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 it's a different ecosystem. It all looks nice and wonderful, but this is not what Earth is supposed to be. There's a reason why you have the poles and why you need the seasons and why you need that amount of snow and ice, what we call ecosystem services, right? We, uh, you know, all these are given by Mother Nature free to us, but there is a cost involved, like what we are experiencing now, you know, in terms of climate change the effects. Faster erosion, okay? Mountains are also kind of uh, eroding, like glaciers especially. If you have a glacier sitting on a, uh, uh, you know, layer of ice or snow, the higher pressures because of the weight of the glacier and also the higher, relatively higher temperatures will make the snow melt and this leads to slow erosion of the mountain. The rate has increased, okay? So mountains are also eroding and uh, this is actually... A lot of this is bad news, not very good to know about. Uh, any of you heard about the term called uh, uh, permafrost? Permafrost. Has this name, does this name ring a bell? Have you heard this term? Permafrost. Should be uh, being in Europe, you should know about it. What is the permafrost? It is... Any idea? If you... When you see all that s snow and ice cap in Greenland, for example, Arctic or even Antarctica, right? It, it's related to that. Any idea now? What it can be? Yeah. Permanently frozen ground under the ice. Yeah. There is carbon and methane trapped in that. Very good. Very good. Yes. The warming. Yes. Very good. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. Permafrost is actually green vegetation. So the last glacial age, it dumped so much of snow, right? It's actually covered with ice. Kilometers, right? Underneath you have the, uh, what we call, you know, the permafrost and that is now getting exposed. And like you mentioned here very correctly, it is kind of uh, locking, it has locked down a lot of fossil fuels, okay, from way back when all the plants and other things uh, got, you know, buried and got decomposed. It is creating fuels, methane and other gases, so which are getting released with the ice slowly thawing. The Himalayas are also in trouble, okay? So across the Himalayas, average temperatures and rainfall are rising by 0 0.6 degrees Celsius and 65 millimeters a decade, leading to increased glacier melt, flooding, and prolonged droughts. This is very interesting, okay? So there is increased glacier melt, there is more flooding, and there is also drought, and also rains, very kind of contradictory, all happening at, you know, kind of uh, uh, maybe simultaneously or maybe separated by suitable intervals in time. And Himalayas are actually very important because they control the monsoons for a, you know, a big chunk of the continent in that area. And they are also very important to planet as a whole. Like Brazil is known as, the Amazon is known as the lungs of the earth. Himalayas are the roof of the world. Okay, you don't want these things to go bad or function, you know, in a bad way. Uh, 
population affected by various risks, risks cumulative risks of two degrees C warming. Uh, it says population affected by various risks in millions of people. The first is heat wave exposure. Then you have water stress. You have risk to power production, crop yield change, and habitat degradation. Okay. In fact, there are a lot of other things which are not mentioned here. It is just giving the most important ones that can go bad and create a problem. Okay. Just kind of uh, uh, increase to two degrees C. By the way, anybody has an idea how? high is the temperature currently when we say climate change how high are we compared to pre-industrial levels or pre-industrial revolution and all that you know we want to take a base right with which we have we have kind of uh, increased to a certain level so i'm saying how much is that increase any guesses you don't have to know the answer but just a guess close to one yeah close to one a one degree Celsius change is causing all this trouble. Can you believe it? Just a one degree Celsius change. And now we know they are talking about going to two or maybe even three by the end of this century. And uh, uh, can I ask you, like, which is the most uh, uh, a certain field in mechanical engineering or engineering which uses the latest mathematical models? It uses the latest computing power, okay? And they use the latest of these technologies to make predictions. Any guess what that might be? Hope my question is not very vague. It is an application in engineering which uses the latest in computers, in theory, okay, and also the algorithms. They want the most cutting edge. And it depends on data. Pardon me? Weather modeling. Yes, weather modeling. The, the, the modeling of weather that you take for granted Right? When you check your cell phone or you look into the news, right, telling you the Hanover weather for the next two or three days, it depends on good modeling in the background. A lot of uh, computational fluid dynamics and other heat transfer modeling goes out in the background for which they use the latest in computers, you know, uh, algorithms and also the data to give you the best accurate focus. And that is supposed to be kind of nonlinear. Climate science is not even nonlinear. Climate science is something, you know, called stochastic. Right? We talk about scenarios in climate change. We don't talk about, we can't be sure about anything. All I can tell you is that it's a 70% chance that the sea level will rise by this much in so and so year. Okay, that's how bad it is. So, and there is a lot of uncertainty. So every year the models are increasing to make this, make the uncertainty lower and lower, but there is an uncertainty. Okay, you can't say for sure what's going to happen and when. Okay, that's one big problem with uh, climate science. And uh, in fact, you should give it to research, R&D, research and development. During, during World War II, right, all the countries involved used a lot of research to predict the weather. Okay? Because weather was a big variable. And they had to use the research to kind of figure out what to do. In fact, a lot of, you know, the advancements you see in weather modeling came from these wars, World War II. Okay? It's very interesting. And a lot of the other gadgets also that we take for granted now came from some of these, you know, uh, I, I would say war or some kind of a revolution, industrial revolutions and the war. That is what led to a lot of the technologies that we see around us. Okay, uh, the glaciers feed about 1.5 billion people across 10 countries for the Himalayas. And they are definitely, there is a third pole. Okay, it's a very important uh, uh, part of Earth's ecosystem, you can't neglect it. And all these things are like silently getting affected with climate change. Is there a way to kind of uh, completely stop climate change? Do you think so? Uh, what would happen if I tell you today that I, I just freeze my, all my carbon emissions? I'm just going to freeze them, okay? So right, say from now, no more emissions all over the Earth, hypothetical, ideal, idealized world, I have the power to do that. I just, you know, uh, flip a switch and voila, all the carbon emissions have gone to zero. You think that will take care of it? Right? Any idea? Why? No? What can be a problem? Right? Please remember, even if you think about stopping carbon emissions today completely, which is not possible, but ideally if you do that, there is still carbon that has gone into the you know, atmosphere over the past years, past you know, many centuries. And to take all of that carbon out will take about half a millennium. 
okay, half a millennium. So even in the ideal case where we stop emissions today, we still have climate change for the next half a millennium. And we are continuously adding emissions to all our activities. That's how bad it is. So slowly we are kind of, you know, uh, uh, it's, it's creating more and more of a problem. So this is an irreversible phenomenon. You can only live with it now and also mitigate at the same time, but we have to adapt to it. It's very important. Uh, glaciers in Peruvian Andes are going, okay? Again, receding. Uh, there are so many, you know, coming from all over the world. So, so much of this news. Uh, any idea what this is? Anybody? What can it be? Any intelligent guesses? We, we talked about it just now, right? Vegetation. Permafrost, yes. That's a permafrost. And all the ice has gone. And this is uh, in Alaska. Permafrost exposed. Okay, this was in 2020. Appeared in nature. Okay, so it's actually a crack that you see there. With the ice slowly thawing. Uh, this is ocean acidity is rising, right? Ocean is one of the major sinks of uh, the carbon that we emit, right? Uh, the, the plants are one, land-based plants and soil and the oceans. Oceans are a big sink. And guess what? The oceans are also getting warmed up. And there is only so much they can take, they're getting saturated. And so the acidity is increasing, okay, in the shallow waters. And this is leading to, not to mention sea ice loss, rising waters, warming waters, pollution and shifting currents, shifting currents. Uh, we are all very fortunate to have something called the uh, meridional currents, right, in the ocean, which also control our weather. But thanks to climate change, even these currents are taking a beating. And you don't want these currents, you know, uh, to stop altogether. That can really be bad for us, pretty bad for us. And here is a quick snapshot, okay, how the ocean thing works. You have the carbon, you know, entering the ocean waters. And then you see increased concentration of CO2, which leads to dead zones that you see here. One possible effect is a dead zone. Uh, crustaceans losing their you know, carbonate to form shells. It also changes the behavior of you know, uh, marine life at different levels. And not to mention also changes the acidity of uh, ocean waters. So ocean is a very important part of this ecosystem and it is getting affected. And the thing about climate change, it's a silent killer. It's just happening, you know, very silently in the background. I think all of us went through the uh, pandemic the last two years, right? And we got tired of it. It was so bad. It disrupted us completely. But there's a bigger killer in the background called climate change, going very silently, okay? Not meaning to scare you, but we need to know the reality. Uh, also, you know, you'll have uh, lead to more longer pollen season and this can lead to some kinds of respiratory diseases, okay, which will get more prevalent. Already in many developing countries, you see increased cases of asthma and other breathing, you know, problems uh, typically coming from uh, uh, pollen season getting drawn out thanks to climate change. Uh, there is also, you know, a mass extinction going on. I don't know how many of you know it. It's a sixth mass extinction currently going on. And uh, thanks to climate change, many of the animals are not able to continue living in the habitat that they chose or where they are kind of born. So a lot of these creatures have to be transferred to other regions, okay, just to make them comfortable and also to make sure that they don't get extinct, okay. So there is an extinction also going on, a loss in biodiversity, and believe me, you know, friends, engineering will play a big role in correcting all this, okay? So I'm not trying to scare you here, but engineering is the answer to a lot of these things, how we can make our make Earth function well, adapt to this, and also mitigate climate change at the same time. Uh, I think there is, I've been reading a lot of news about polar bears, you know, uh, being found in all kinds of uh, weird areas. And in fact, they're coming into many of the Canadian towns, which they're not supposed to because, simply because the ice is receding. There is, you know, not much of the, the prey or the food on which they survive is also getting lesser because of this. So all, all these are like a, it, it's like a knock-on effect. One thing affects the other. It's such a sensitive chain, you know, that one thing goes bad, it affects everything else. Grazing, right? It, this is in Brazil. Right, I think uh, leads to deforestation, lungs of earth being affected. Okay, so 
so many things happening around the world any any questions about uh, everything is okay my delivery and okay no problem right you can understand me and okay and every year seems to be t become hotter it, it it it's creating a world record every subsequent year i hear this you know that so and so here was the hottest compared to all the previous ones this was taken in 2014 but the same trend holds even now uh nasa has confirmed it right this is like 2014 to 18 it shows the average increase and you can see that most of the planet is kind of yellowish orange or red showing uh, how the planet has warmed up satellites also confirm it okay through uh, this was a nice embedded gif for some reason it's not working so they're tracking how the vegetation changes with time as a mark for climate change you know the other thing is many people will always ask you how do you know climate change is occurring and for that source is very important what you read right uh, what you refer to you have the international energy agency there are a lot of these other agencies that have data we can actually go through that and take a look okay just convince yourself that this is happening and uh, i remember i don't remember the name of the scientist but sometime way back uh, an experiment was started to measure uh, <clears throat> you know the pollution in the air on a certain mountain in hawaii okay and it was so far away from the rest of uh, human influence that they thought this was a very nice location to measure how you know pristine and how clear earth's atmosphere is and that is taken as a datum as a reference to see how we are messing up this planet with the pollution and that actually tracks the carbon concentration very well have a chance you can also take a look at that all these are there on the internet now it you can just you know with a click you can look at these things uh live feed you know you can look at the data and convince yourself soils are threatened okay so uh soils also store methane and other greenhouse gases so any time we do agriculture or we disturb the soil right as part of our activities we are actually releasing these gases again other culprits are sulfur dioxide greenhouse gases nitrous oxide methane we talked about and hydrofluorocarbons okay other than carbon dioxide anybody heard about sulfur dioxide does it, does it ring a bell sulfur dioxide any idea where it might be released where one might mining operations yeah any natural phenomena volcanoes yes volcanoes release uh, sulfur dioxide thank you very good uh, sulfur dioxide is like a sulfur dioxide crystals are a double edged sword can i call it that or maybe uh, they have two different effects they can either cool the planet or they can warm it okay they have a good albedo effect meaning you know when you have sulfur dioxide crystals in the atmosphere the incoming sunlight gets reflected back so by doing that they cool the planet but they can also reflect it back to earth and in the process create more warming so any time there's a volcano which is a bad thing to have once the volcano is over the region becomes very cool okay you can just read this any time you have a volcano the regions become cooler it it actually looks like paradise after some time okay so sulfur dioxide has its property so now there is people are talking about something called have you also heard about this term if you are in sustainability there is a chance you have heard about it have you heard about this team a uh, term sorry geo engineering okay this is like really high tech you know working on controlling planet earth so what is show in movies right you have all these uh, superheroes controlling the planet and all you know something like that but realistically and geo engineering it actually uh, one of the schemes in geo engineering is to uh, put sulfur dioxide crystals in the atmosphere <clears throat> to reflect the sunlight and cool the planet that's one of the things that they are actually looking into okay but sulfur dioxide like i told you it it has got it can it can either cool but it can also warm so we have to be very careful how we use it nitrous oxide anybody where nitrous oxide emissions are found it's it's you see a lot of it in something that you take for granted and you do when you go places 
we say NOx emissions, right? Nitrous oxide emissions. It rings a bell. Cars, cars, partly cars, automotive, also aviation, right? So when you fly, there's a lot of nitrous oxide emissions. So if you fly, you're actually putting, you know, this nice carbon dioxide, this this nice uh, NOx uh, to the greenhouse gas, you know, shield that you see around the planet. You're actually building it in a way. But look, I should not be blaming anybody. I had to fly to come here. We have to do that, okay? So it looks odd for me to tell you this. But we have to find and maybe an engineering solution to this. They're talking about, you know, battery or uh, electric operated aviation. Or maybe even with internal combustion engines, which don't do this. Maybe there's a way to get around it. But we have to think about it, okay? So how to kind of get around this? Methane, we talked about methane. Methane is a major problem, okay? Because with fossil fuels, when we get, you know, all the fossil fuels that we take for granted, Methane is also extracted, and there is a lot of leakage of methane in the process. So that is, I know, they're finding different ways to control all of this, but this is a major source of problem. And currently they say that before controlling for carbon dioxide emissions, we should control for methane. It is easily achievable, the target, to control methane emissions. And by doing that, we'll leave a bigger footprint, you know, in terms of climate change. Okay? It will actually lead to... And uh, uh, a relatively significant drop in temperatures, you know, uh, uh, with what we are going on currently. Hydrofluorocarbons. Hydrofluorocarbons. Anybody? Name rings a bell. Uh, refrigerants. Exactly. Yes, refrigerants. If you have a refrigerant, it's a hydrofluorocarbon. Uh, any idea? Some other refrigerant had a problem. Some other refrigerant had a problem some time back. Not climate change, something else. The, uh, ozone. ozone hole, yeah. I think those were chlorofluorocarbons. And then we were told that we should go for this because, you know, it's, it, it doesn't damage the ozone hole. But guess what? It turns out it's a major problem from a climate change perspective. So now hydrofluorocarbons are also supposed to be bad news. This is interesting, right? Seriously, dude, you're really receding. Okay, I thought that was a nice uh, cartoon, okay? So, uh, in fact, many times even I can say that what I'm going through is climate change, okay? So, can't help it. Uh, what can be a good proxy for emissions by individual nations? Can you tell me? Okay, if, if I take a country like Germany, right? Or pick any country you want, and I want to know what are the total emissions of that country, how do you do that? I mean, there are so many activities happening in a country, right? So many regions, so many activities. But you can't do all of that, you know, it's not possible to do that, you know? Then the scale is just, uh, it's, it's kind of humongous. So what we do, we take a proxy. We look at something else, which is a good measure for a country's emissions. So what would you do? Any idea? What can be a good proxy? In terms of regions, I'll even make it uh, simpler. Instead of looking at a whole country, right? Or is there regions I can look at? Or are there some activities, certain activities in a country that I should look at? What, what would you think? What would be your take? Just to know the emissions, right? We want to know, right? What are the total emissions of a country? That's how we rank, right? Who are the top emitters currently, remember? We see that uh, the United States of America, then you know China, then you have India, uh, Europe, all of these are like top emitters. But how do we arrive at that? How do we do that? Pardon me? Per? Per capita is one way of doing that, yeah. That would be more like a unit. But I'm saying what can be a proxy? I can't obviously measure everything in a country. Like if I take something like India, it's such a big country. Right? So many activities, I can't measure everything. But I'm taking something which is major, which is a good proxy. I can say, yeah, you know, there is some error, but it's not too much. I can believe this. What can it be? In terms of regions, don't even go into the activity. Okay? We'll, we'll freeze on the activity for now. I'm just saying regions. What will I look at? Will I look at a whole country? Or will I look only at certain spots in the country? Right? Certain spots in the country, what would those be? Where would you look for emissions? 
Will it be rural areas or will it be urban areas? Urbanization, has anybody you know, ever thought about that? Urbanization is adding its own warming to all of this, okay? Because cities are getting very clustered now. Too many you know, people in cities because that is where a lot of opportunities are. So in addition to this big climate change occurring, you also have little pockets, cities, where the effect is intensified. So cities are a good proxy to measure. And this is according to right, the OECD the uh, Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, right, which is very popular in the Europe, OECD. And they say that urban emissions from, you know, this one, urban emissions from the OECD, the group of developed nations will grow only slightly, emissions from non-OECD cities will double. Okay, so they're using cities as a basis. So using this, you can actually figure out how the cities' carbon emissions are rated here. For Canada, China, Germany, Japan, Netherlands, and US, this is a slightly older chart, okay? So even within cities, there is a difference, okay? But cities are a good proxy, just to get, add up, you know, the emissions coming from all the cities to uh, see what the total emissions are. This is very important now, a, go, a global carbon footprint. Every product that you hold with you, there is an embodied energy in it. Embodied meaning all the energy that was spent in making that product which you now hold, okay? So here, a study shows the origin of carbon dioxide em embodied in goods and services consumed by country, in this case, Japan. So goods and services consumed by country in Japan, and it has two bars there. One is where the fuels were combusted, okay, and where fuels were extracted. Obviously, the services were used in Japan, so a lot of fuel is combusted there, okay, whatever that good or service is. But you can also see that a lot of fuels are extracted in all these other countries. Okay? In fact, they were also combusted in many of these other countries so that the Japanese can use it. Okay? So all of these products now have something called an embodied energy. So we need to pay attention to that. You might say that, okay, I made this thing, I consumed this much energy, it is not much. But yeah, but what about the energy used for uh, extracting the, the plastic okay? or extracting the metal that went into it? More like something what we call life cycle analysis. You have to look at the whole cycle right, of that uh, product. So... Uh, we are looking at a very different way, you know, into how to look at products and services from here onwards. Uh, flight emissions. Researchers worldwide routinely fly to scientific conferences to present papers, learn of new findings, and make connections. But there is an environmental cost to those flights. Here are the average carbon dioxide emissions for several common flights in kilograms of CO2 per round trip economy ticket. Okay? So you can see that, you know, just flying for conferences or any of these long distance flights are kind of carbon intensive. But like I said, this is a must. We, we can't avoid it. We can't avoid many of these things that we are doing currently. But how can we use engineering to kind of tackle this and, you know, kind of make this possible, make this continue? Uh, carbon shrugs of crisis. We always have all these crises going on, you know, the, the US subprime mortgage, economic collapse of the U Soviet Union, all these crises happening one after the other, but still, and we always say that, you know, mankind needs to do something about carbon, but still, carbon is uh, ruling supreme, okay? It will take some time for it to completely go because renewables and electric vehicles, all the other things that we talk about also will take time to catch on, right, cost-wise and also technology-wise. Finally, we are recognizing climate change as part of a formal discipline. I don't know how many of you know this. Uh, uh, do you know what is a current geological epoch, right? You know geology, right? We have large uh, chunks of time, and we, we divide them into different eras, right? There is one, there's, there's an era that this we belong to currently. It starts with an H the English alphabet H. Any idea what it might be? Have you heard about it? It's called the Holocene, right? It's supposed to be part of the Holocene. But now they're saying that we need to change this to Anthropocene, okay? So looking at a certain number of years where this thing starts, they say that humans have left a very clear influence in everything, in every endeavor of this planet. So actually we should call this Anthropocene from here onwards. Okay, it's an, so climate change is part of this. It's human-induced. 
you know, there are different, uh, uh, we keep on getting these different scenarios, business as usual and whatnot. And I don't want to go through this. I think I've covered a lot of the things that I've been talking about, sea level rise, uh, you know, many of the bad climate effects, deforestation and whatnot. Uh, we are here looking at what the world is doing from here onwards, okay, to combat this crisis currently. Right? Thresholds are misleading. Every time we have a meeting, a new meeting, an IPCC meeting or whatever, right, uh, leaders gather at a point and we, we hash out or we discuss a certain limit. Yeah, so 1.5 is the current limit, you know, something like that. So like I told you, it's a very stochastic phenomenon and there are no definite uh, numbers here, okay? The things, the goalpost, you know, keeps changing. So one thing the world is doing now, the good things are that there are a lot of patents and uh, being uh, gotten out for clean technology. There's a lot of clean techn technology being developed around the world, okay? So many countries are now jumping on this because this can also be the first more advantage. If you do something for climate change, develop some nice products now, you know, nice uh, technologies, which will be very useful in the future. So this is the time to get into it and to see how you can help planet Earth from, with an engineering product or a service. So the numbers of patents and all kinds of documents that talk about different devices on clean tech are rising. Okay, and mixed picture as far as our, you know, uh, fuels are concerned, of course there are renewables, nuclear energy, hydroelectricity hydro and fossil fuels, but currently renewables are catching on, they're becoming cost effective, economically they look, uh, they're competing with fossil fuels, okay, the picture will get better and better, and I'm kind of very looking forward to the future because this will, this will lead to a very different kind of ecosystem and a different kind of economy, okay, and I think fossil fuels days are numbered. It will take some more time to go, but I think we won't be using them forever. Sunny outlook, wind and a burgeoning solar industry are boosting clean energy in the US, okay? So like I told you, economically it is becoming quite attractive. Uh, trend watch, this is very interesting actually, geography of impact. In fact, many of the people who deny climate change, the politicians, right, they seem to be having the most amount of losses coming from climate change, okay? So climate change induced losses economically. Many of the, you know, the dominant party in the US, right, which kind of does not support climate change or climate change action much, uh, many of the constituencies supporting them are going to see more of the losses. Okay, a lot of things are going into it, you know, this is a very interesting picture. Uh, this is very interesting where this entire bus is driven by human waste, okay? Human waste is actually powering this entire vehicle. And uh, this was, I think, developed in the UK. So all kinds of these devices are coming into the picture to uh, kind of wean ourselves away from uh, carbon, you know, or fossil fuels. Any idea what is this? What can, it looks like a nice hotel, right? It is a hotel, it's a nice one, okay? And the beauty is, it is, powered by an underground river, okay? This is somewhere in Europe, if I'm not mistaken, I think this is taken from uh, Ireland, I think, okay? Irish Times. It's either Ireland or Denmark, I forget. But uh, there is an underground river and they actually tap into it to power the entire hotel. Very interesting. <clears throat> this is very interesting, guys. This came in Environmental Research Letters in 2018. It says, uh, personal choices to reduce your contribution to climate change. Different things that uh, one can do. Okay, your low impact, moderate impact and high impact. Can you read it from there? Possible, right? So upgrading to light bulbs, hang dry clothes and recycle. Uh, this, all these fall into low to moderate impact. Uh, washing clothes in cold water. Okay, and then you have a replaced typical car with hybrid. Uh, eat a plant-based diet, okay? Now, this is very controversial. A lot of these topics are also quite controversial, but I'm just saying what they have figured out based on, you know, the numbers that they have. Switch electric car to car-free, okay? Like maybe uh, pooling a ride. Buy green energy. Avoid one round-trip transatlantic flight, okay? And uh, live car-free. Have one fewer child. It's like, I don't know. It's, uh, but, but these are all the options given what can create a... a uh, you know, to, to a lifestyle which will help us to combat uh, climate change. 
climate in court. Okay, so there are, I don't know how many of you realize this, but a lot of uh, court cases being fought. Okay, many companies and countries have been dragged to the courts by different uh, activist groups and other groups, you know, just to tell them that, hey, look, you know, I think your actions are not good. It is putting our future in danger. Okay, so many of your uh, more than 1,300 lawsuits related to climate change have been filed in at least 28 countries and other jurisdictions since around 1990. Three quarters are in the U.S. Okay. This is uh, Climate Cash. Latest fundraising session, 27 countries pledged U.S. $9.8 billion to the Green Climate Fund. Okay. There are, please look at all the different kinds of options that are being put on the table. Other than engineering, making actual products and devices, uh, there are also a lot of other policies that are being crafted to help us deal with this problem, this menace. Now we come to something called sustainability. Okay? With all this background that I've given you, I, I don't know if I've, uh, some of you are from the sustainability group, but overall engineering, engineers, non-engineers, I think we, we have been told about climate change again and again. Right? Not a day goes by when a news item or whatever you read doesn't refer to climate change. It has become more like a cliche, right? You might get tired of listening to it, but it is important to know that, you know, this is affecting all walks of life. And I feel, I for one feel that it's going to change everything for the better. Okay, it's going to streamline all our activities and engineering is one such thing which is going to get streamlined majorly. It's already happening. Okay, it will get more and more uh, as we go into the future. So sustainability is, it has been taken from forestry. Okay, in forestry, what you do typically or what you're supposed to do when you deforest a land, you're supposed to you know, plant an equal number of trees to take care of the deforestation. That's how they look at it, so that you leave the forest in a good functioning condition to future generations. So sustainability means you know, using the planets and its resources currently so that you don't damage it to future generations. So your children and grandchildren can also enjoy the same planet that you did. Okay, so that is what sustainability is all about. So with that in mind, okay, uh, sustainability has been invoked or uh, uh, kind of talked about in all kinds of human endeavors. And sustainability is uh, uh, it, it's, it's a very nice concept wherein if you have to keep the earth functioning well for a long time to come, you would agree with me that you have to extract lesser resources, right? What does that mean? I take, whenever I extract something, I use it for a longer time, or maybe use it forever. Technically, if I have a piece of metal, I can keep using it forever, okay? So you can reuse it, remanufacture, refurbish, whatever. You keep using it again and again and again. Same family of products, or maybe a different family of products. But we have a lot of R's in sustainability, like reuse, remanufacture, uh, all kinds of things, you know, which will help us to use a given quantity of material for a longer period in time, okay? It's a very important concept. And in this, we have something called frugality. Frugality is lesser resources, right? So you take lesser resources from this planet and hopefully keep using it for a long time, ideally forever, but maybe for a long time, so that we take lesser and lesser from this planet. By doing that, you are cutting on the use of resources, you are minimizing your use of resources, and by minimizing the use of resources, you are also minimizing typically the emissions that come out of it. And you are helping, you know, to combat, in a way, climate change. It's a very important concept. It's called cradle to cradle. Okay, you might have heard about this too. It's not cradle to grave, it's cradle to cradle. It, it, it's, a, it's a nice intersection between the environment, economy, and society. Okay, it takes all of their concerns into account, sustainability. Okay, so that's one thing very nice about it. And the three R's, recycle, reuse, and recovery. All the R's, just remember all the R's which are very important in sustainability. Products are enabled for sustainability in different ways. Okay, you might already be knowing about this, but it's very interesting to know that many of the products we currently use are, have a lot of sensors which actually monitor how these things function. Okay, how these things function over a period of time. 
and uh, this can be used to monitor you know what are the emissions and how efficiently the product is working okay so a lot of the products are built with uh, sensors and uh, your palm type devices to measure you know how to how these things are functioning over a period of time there's also something called disassembly i don't know how many of you know about this but when a product reaches end of life you have to now in this current age we have to disassemble it and hopefully use every part of it coming out for the same family of products or maybe for for a new family now disassembly it itself will consume a lot of energy so how to make disassembly operations that are energy efficient so or disassembly friendly okay so sensors disassembly friendly and uh, what else uh, i think that more or less you know covers all of them and you see a big range of products here cell phones uh, washing machines there is a uh, boogie right from a railway chassis uh, all kinds of products internal combustion engine also so uh, any idea what this might be it's very interesting to see that what uh, what this tells you the slide what does it connect any idea what it is one thing leading to the other you see a backpack right these two sides this is actually a banner right you know what a banner is right the big cloth banners that they used to have in the past in airports and other places right to put an ad or whatever so this was found in chicago o'hare airport they took the banner and made it into backpacks and actually sold this okay very interesting application okay one thing leading to the other not the same family of products but something totally new uh this is any idea what this is anybody yeah yeah great pacific garbage trash but what what's it mainly composed of uh what kind of garbage any idea majority you're right it's it's a great pacific garbage patch but it it's composed of something right uh, mainly pardon me plastics mainly plastics so this watch company which is a a luxury watch maker called uh, oris so what they have done they take this plastic and put a small patch of the plastic at the back of the watch okay it's just a watch and it adds to the i don't know what do you call aesthetics right it's a luxury watch and there are people actually who pay for this thing knowing that they are helping the planet okay very interesting application just take the plastic from the patch and kind of apply it at the back of the watch uh rolls royce rolls royce is into a lot of uh, and also the other you know companies which make engines they are now on a drive to make things electric okay electric might also not be the answer we don't know but currently that looks uh, the way research is going it is technology is getting better and also cost effective we don't know what new things will come up you know in the foreseeable future but yeah currently all these companies are now heading into a very uh Uh, electric future okay a lot of them are you know betting on that uh is this the end of internal combustion engines what do you think an internal combustion engine fossil fuels right opposed to electric you think it's the end of that right also been telling that to you no okay uh anybody else any other view point why do you think it's a no a great yes it is it is i i do agree with you on that okay although they have, they, they have sounded the death knell for internal combustion engines it will it will be there for some time more okay because for some things that ic engines do just so well right currently if you look at uh, aviation gas turbine jet engines right they 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 function very well we don't know how this will work with a uh, battery operated vehicle you know uh, aviation batteries are also quite heavy and aviation you also want things which are quite light you price them for the weight 
right? So that, that's what your entire, uh, lot of your uh, aircrafts are built on, right? Lesser weight. We don't know how these things will kind of unfold in the future, but saying that IC engines are kind of, you know, it's an end for IC engines, which is kind of, I don't know what to make of it. And they are here for some time to stay, for sure. And you can actually make the IC engine more, you know, efficient. So Rolls-Royce is actually doing that for their gas turbine jet engines, okay? Or any engine for that matter. Do you know what I'm talking about? It is a very nice sustainability initiative. So you're trying to make your engines more efficient, improving their efficiency, right? Design better engines. To design better engines, what do you need? You need more? Yeah, when you go from one version to the next version of an engine, of a product, do you think it's, don't you think it's good to have the data for how the product is used, how it's functioning in real life? If that data is available, you can actually use it to design better versions, the next later versions. Do you agree with that, right? So, Rolls-Royce started this trend wherein all their engines are monitored 24-7. And I think this happens from a place called Coventry in England, where they have a big uh, a structure, uh, a facility, wherein they actually track every one of their products which is in use around the world continuously. And this is to tell their clients if the product needs some maintenance, okay, some kind of maintenance or things are going bad or whatever. But the data that they get real time is also used to design better engines, streamline their engines for, you know, uh, the next uh, versions, okay. And other companies are also doing that. I believe Pratt & Whitney is also into it. And this is what we call, you know, building inbuilt sensors. So you can track what a product is doing online when it's, you know, in the field. This helps, you know, in controlling your, uh, uh, creating better designs, better products, which are good from a climate perspective, okay, for the later versions. Sustainability in China. China is one of, uh, I, th I think, majorly into disassembly, okay, technologies. They have mastered this quite well. It was already a low-cost manufacturing job shop for the world. And what they figured out is, I think this was back in, I believe, 2006 or 7, that they had so many millions of vehicles on the road, and a lot of them are going to reach end of life, meaning the junkyard, and what do we do with them? How can we kind of, you know, use as much of these cars as possible, so not everything is a waste? And this has led to a big disassembly industry in China, and as you can see in this chart, right, every part of the vehicle is used, okay? Right from the, the, the liquids, uh, the metal, the tires, the plastics, you name it. Whatever you see there, right, every part of it is kind of used as much as possible, either as a spare part for, you know, existing vehicles, or maybe it goes into a new vehicle, or maybe goes into a new product altogether. Okay, and here the major thing is how disassembly is done in a very uh, effective manner. So you consume lesser energy and in a very environment friendly manner. So this is one example of getting ahead in the clean tech game, right? What you do now, you might have more expenditure now for getting into cleaner technology, but you're becoming a leader. With time, believe me, a lot of us are going to lead all, need all these technologies because climate change is here to stay with us. So all these, you know, uh, products and services that are coming out are very important. Any questions till now? I see a lot of you also yawning and, you know, kind of feel free to ask questions or anything. If you don't agree or agree, I'd like to hear your views also. Okay, feel free to chip in. Going green. Uh, any idea what this can be? Some of you might already be doing this. Wherein I'm tracking environmental impact of resources, chemicals, components, production, use, disposal. The T stands for transportation. Any idea what it might be? It's, it's got a name, right? Which is very popular nowadays, in engineering circles at least. Heard about it? Starts with a life.
life cycle assessment have you heard about this technique okay right so any product we are now you you have to see everything for that product right right from the time you extract your resources uh, to the production to operation and finally disposal assembly uh, disassembly okay so your your product has to be a net uh, energy saver you know considering all these options only then only then can you call the product being climate friendly sustainable supply chains so here is one thing you might like bmw is supposed to have a very good sustainable supply chain okay uh, they they are one of the companies that are uh, into the sustainability game there are lot of lots of others unilever you heard about unilever right unilever is very interesting because <clears throat> they have a culture which is also quite sustainable not just the products but the entire i think that the company works in a very sustainable manner okay the culture is one that supports sustainability the facilities that they work with are made climate friendly the products that they make are made climate friendly so they have invested quite a bit in this and it's actually paying off a lot there also one of the examples i will later show you on uh, frugal innovations what they are doing you guys want to have a break now or at 10:30 Pardon me. Ten thirty is fine. Okay. Okay. This is another nice uh, case study on uh, uh, a washing machine. Okay. So you have two different uh, mechanisms here. Okay. Two different uh, designs. What you see here and what you see there. The only difference being that this one, you see this red lever, right? You just pull it apart, and the whole thing just falls apart. It is very disassembly friendly. meaning i don't have to use any energized devices to uh, disassemble the whole thing when we are done with it so when you compare the two you can see number of parts right uh, the the better design has a value of 16 number of parts number of connections are 42 for that as opposed to 112 uh, different connection types are just one compared to four and tools are none but here you require you know energized uh, screw drivers pliers and all that so you can see the total score you have an 80% score for the winning model here shown here you just pull the thing apart and you know a lever and the whole thing automatically disassembles many cell phones have that nowadays you don't have to use lot of disassembly you know devices to uh, screw drivers and other things you know Ener energy based devices to unscrew these things you can just pull a nice little string or a plug and it just falls apart okay so that you can use the different parts for maybe some other cell phone or maybe a different set of uh, products there's also sustainability index now i don't know how many of you know this dow jones sustainability index for those of you who are investing in stocks right there is also an index that tracks companies that are sustainable okay so it's a basket of companies that are truly sustainable which have a products and the culture which 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 you know kind of deeply embedded with sustainability okay so there is sustainability index any companies that you know which are sustainable talked about bmw we talked about unilever any other companies that you know which a serious thing okay they are not doing this to do csr like what they call corporate social responsibility this is really very they are using it to uh, better their business it's helping them in their business right any 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 companies that come to mind i've heard that puma is into it you know the german uh, sports maker right sports gadget maker it's into sustainability any other names come to mind there are many and how, how do you think they're doing it are they doing it out of their own uh volition or meaning uh, uh they just feeling good about doing that or how does this come about what is making them do it in other way so many companies are falling into sustainability they, they are actually using it okay for the business but i'm saying how are they made to do that is it something that they are feeling that they should do it or yeah Pro profit is the main thing right 
green washing yeah true true but what is the factor controlling it more we have green washing we have all of that i'm with you on that okay Agreed. Clients desire it. Agreed. Yeah. But how is this coming about? You're all right. Greenwashing. Clients are asking for it. Companies are using it. Okay. The, the company using it to make kind of better products will come to that. But there's something else happening with all this. Right? And policy making. Right? Governments are putting mandates now. Right? So many countries are now saying if you export to us or, you know, it has to be like sustainable and green. And there are certain standards that you have to meet, which is now forcing many of these people to do, you know, kind of get into the sustainability bandwagon. But I would say that sustainability definitely leads to better products. Okay? You see, when you use lesser resources and you streamline a product for better functionality, it makes something totally new, which you might not even have thought about, and which might be a winning product or service later. Okay? It's a combination of the two. But it would be good if... People who make, uh, you know, businesses which are involved in this game naturally believe in it for its advantages and make better use of it. Uh, there's a nice uh, study on the Shinkansen, right? The equivalent of uh, the fast trains in Japan. And they did a life cycle analysis. Okay, this was done a long time back actually. I think it's a more a 2003 or the work that it did was even maybe a decade beyond, you know, before that. Uh, Japan always has a respect for resources because they're also sitting on that part of the planet which is prone to more earthquakes, volcanoes, and lesser resources. So they try to be very efficient in what they can get out of it. And uh, any idea who first formally recognized climate change as a problem? Formally, I'm saying. Government. As a government. Right? We now have IPCC. We have all these meetings, right? Where all these leaders meet and talk about climate change, saying, yeah, it's a bad thing, all that. But I'm saying, which was the country that formally first started looking into it? It was a protocol that was signed sometime in 96, I think in the 90s. It's a Kyoto Protocol. came from Japan. Okay? And that time, I think they... they a lot of countries ratified it, saying that yeah, climate change is a major problem and how our businesses and other things have to be changed to account for this. So this is one country which has also been looking into it for a long time. And there's an interesting case study from the, the Shinkansen. So they said, how can we build the next generation of bullet trains which are energy efficient, okay, or net energy savers? So you do a life cycle analysis on right from the extraction of materials that go into making a high-speed train and also its operation, uh, production, operation, and then disassembly. Take all these things together, which is what is a net energy saver. So they figured out that the first thing we need to do is use aluminum or aluminium, the metal, to make the body of the train. Any problem with aluminium? Any problem with the metal aluminium? or aluminum. Yeah? Somewhat scarce. Somewhat scarce. Okay. Quite energy intensive. Okay. Uh, finding it scarce. Yeah. I can say that. Good. But something else to it? Other than, other than being scarce about aluminum? Uh, how do you, uh, what is the operation called when you get aluminum from its ore? Right? When you extract aluminum. There's a process that is used which starts with an S. Smelting. Smelting. Right? So, extraction of aluminum, other than being scarce, is also very energy intensive. Okay? So, aluminum is a very popular metal because it's lightweight. It's used in many things, automotive and aerospace, because of its lower weight. But extracting aluminum is very energy intensive. So it has a lot of benefits, but it is also a very energy guzzling uh, metal. Okay? But Japan decides to kind of use aluminum. Okay? And they've considered other materials along with that. 
they had wood, I think they considered wood, uh, steels, you know, lots of other things, but aluminum came out as a winner. But like I told you, for a climate change thing, you have to look at the whole thing. For a life cycle analysis, you see the whole picture, not just the material that you're going for. The next thing that they looked at was an aerodynamic design for the train, okay? It looks more like the, if you look at the nose of the train, right? It has an aerodynamic design to reduce the drag at very high speeds when you go, right? So that the uh, uh, flow of air is quite streamlined and nice and you don't have a problem. Uh, anything else other than that, which actually changed the whole picture? Do you think about a technology? I don't think it's mentioned here. Something that can come in very handy when you're going at very high speeds. When a train of this mass is going at a very high speed, right? Or even your ICE, right? You have so much of momentum, right? So much of what? What else? The brakes are? Bricks are important, yeah. The bricks are important, but uh, in a different way. Bricks are important, obviously. Okay? Bricks are important. But higher speeds lead to what? Higher momentum, so what? Higher? Something very important from a climate perspective. Huh? Temperatures, of course. Yeah, higher speeds, you break, like he said, it's going to create higher temperatures. Energy consumption, yes, yeah, sure. It's related to energy. You're more kinetic energy, right? And all of you are right. So <coughs> when you decelerate, you break this train, it comes to a halt, all this energy is dissipated. So what they do is something called regenerative braking. So you take all that energy which is you know, decelerated and convert that to electricity. Either you store it in the battery or you feed it to the grid. So by doing this, the Shinkansen has become an energy winner. Use aluminum to make the body, an aerodynamic design, and a regenerative brake. All of these three combined together to make it a winner. Okay, so that is how you look at it. And I think all their uh, series of trains, right, are kind of uh, using this to advantage. I think we'll stop here. I see some of you also yawning and sleeping. Okay, I think take a 10-minute break. I know it might feel a bit boring now with the sustainability part, but as we go forward, this is important to know why we are doing what we are doing, okay? So you have a 10-minute break. Maybe we'll meet at around 10.40, fine, and continue from here.